Good evening, I'm Kelly Gear Ripkin, National Chair of A Women's Journey. On behalf of Johns Hopkins Medicine's A Woman's Journey, thank you for joining us this evening for our monthly webcast series, Conversations That Matter. A Woman's Journey strives to improve your well-being through health education. March is Endometriosis Awareness Month. According to the Endometriosis Foundation of America, endometriosis affects one in 10 reproductive aged individuals an estimated 200 million women worldwide. Many often experience a decade long delay in diagnosis. Currently, there is no known exact cause of endometriosis and there's no cure. Tonight, we are joined by Johns Hopkins gynecologist, Dr. Karen Wang, whose primary clinical focus is on the surgical management of benign gynecological conditions, including abnormal bleeding, fibroids, endometriosis, and pelvic pain. So please use your Q&A on your screen to ask your questions to Dr. Wang, who will respond to them the last 20 minutes or so of tonight's conversation. Our webcast will conclude at 8 p.m. I want to take this opportunity to acknowledge and thank Johns Hopkins University's program, Hopkins at Home, for the production assistance. And you can visit their website for additional lectures and courses throughout the year. And now I am pleased to welcome Dr. Wang. Thank Wang? you so much. Thank you. Um, it's an honor for me to be here tonight um, to talk about something that I manage on a daily basis. So this is exciting for, for me and our group as well. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Um, so for this evening, um, in terms of what I plan to go over, I'm gonna review what endometriosis is, how and why it occurs in terms of what information that we have available to us, what symptoms that patients who have endometriosis can have, um, how it's diagnosed, and what the current available treatment options are for patients. So endometriosis is defined as a chronic gynecologic benign disorder, where the glands of the lining of the uterus, that layer of tissue that we normally shed every month during our periods, can grow outside of the uterus. What happens is once those um, glands implant, it can lead to a lot of chronic inflammation as well as irritation, which then can cause the symptoms that they do. Um, it is something that is sensitive to hormones. So estrogen is what can stimulate growth of these endometriosis glands. And here you can see a schematic of a uterus um, that you can see here the, the fallopian tubes, the ovaries, the uterus itself, which is in the center, the endometrial cavity here, uh, the cervix. Um, and endometriosis can really involve any parts of the uterus as well as um, outside of the uterus too. So who gets endometriosis? Well, as um, Kelly had mentioned, it is very prevalent. It can occur in about 10 to 15% of premenopausal women peaking between the ages of 25 to 35. In women with issues with infertility or subfertility, it can occur in about 30 to 50% of these patients. And for patients who have pelvic pain, especially chronic pelvic pain, it can occur in about 60 to 70% of these patients. When we try to look at risk factors for who gets endometriosis or who has endometriosis, um, some of the, the factors that we've found is that uh, for women who have um, no pregnancies before or fewer pregnancies, or for women who have longer periods of time when they have estrogen production, meaning if they start through <clears throat> start with um, menarche or when they start to have their periods at a very young age, or they um, have menopause at a very late age. So there's just a long period of time where their bodies are exposed to more estrogen. Uh, for women who have more frequent menstrual cycles or longer menstrual cycles, um, there is a genetic component to endometriosis. So it does run in families. Um, and there is some component of lifestyle that could be a risk factor. So for patients who have decreased regular exercise or increased alcohol consumption, they have found slightly higher rates of endometriosis. So how does endometriosis occur? Um, the exact cause is not truly understood fully, but there have been several theories that have been proposed. The most common and most widely accepted is retrograde menstruation. So what that means is that when you're having your period, instead of the um, having the period flow through the cervix and out of the body, sometimes it will backwards flow through the fallopian tubes um, where then it can implant on the tubes, the ovaries, or in the 
posterior or the back part of the um, uterus, as well as in the cul-de-sac, which is the space between the uterus and your intestines. So um, it's thought that as the blood flows through, the endometrial tissue is um, passed through and then it can implant into the pelvic cavity. So this is definitely the most common theory for that. Other theories on how endometriosis occur include a stem cell theory where um, stem cells in the endometrium will transform and then develop into endometriosis when it's displaced to an abnormal location. It can also potentially pass through lymphatic systems or through blood vessels. And then otherwise the tissue that lines our pelvic and abdominal cavity, um, are, the cells are able to transform into endometrial cells and cause endometriosis. The reason why um, the retrograde menstruation isn't fully the 100% accurate theory is that they have found endometriosis in um, girls before puberty. So for girls who haven't started their periods yet. And so that's why there are theories about other um, alternative ways that endometriosis has developed. When we look at other factors of endometriosis, um, it is thought to be um, related to a hormone imbalance in within the endometriosis lesions. So with having an excess uh, amount of estrogen within the body, um, it causes an inflammatory uh, response usually to the tissue. There is also thought that if um, there's alterations of your immune system, like your body is not able to dispose of or, or get rid of those endometriosis atopic glands, um, and then there's also the factor of um, genetics as well. So where do we commonly see endometriosis? Um, most commonly it's in the dependent areas of the pelvis. Um, again, going along the theory of retrograde menstruation where the blood will flow back through the tubes. They can implant on the ovaries, which you can kind of see here depicted in this picture. Um, and then also within the posterior cul-de-sac, as I was mentioning before, which is the space between the uterus and your intestine. Um, and then less commonly, it can also travel to other parts of the body. And this is where we believe like it can pass through through the lymphatics or through blood vessels, because in some cases you can have involvement of your bladder. You can have your involvement of the intestines as far as way as the lungs or even in the abdominal wall or the skin as well. So what can endometriosis look like? Um, there's a, a wide variety, a wide range of how it can look. You can have superficial or very small implants that are just on the surface of the organs or on the peritoneum, which is that layer of tissue that kind of protects all our internal organs. Um, it can occur within the ovary. You can have a cyst that forms, or you can have deeper or larger infiltrating lesions of the different organs. So if you look at this picture below, here is an example of large intestine, and you can see this endometriosis implant that is on the surface and probably extending deeper down into the bowel. If you'd look at this top right picture, these are the powder burn lesions, which are some of the classic lesions that you can see with endometriosis. The part of the body this is, is behind the uterus. So right here would be the cervix. This is a, a ligament called the uterosacral ligament. Um, and so this is at the back part of the uterus. So you can see here, there's these dark lesions that are um, involving the ligament itself. And then here's an example of an endometrioma, which is a cyst within the ovary um, that has endometriosis in it. So the uterus is here in the center, and this is the left ovary here, and this is looking within the capsule of the cyst itself. Um, and in terms of looking at how patients present, it, there is actually a wide variety. So again, most commonly affects reproductive age women. Uh, most of the women will present with some issues of pain, whether it's pain when they have their period, what we call dysmenorrhea, pain when they have a bowel movement, what we call dyskesia, uh, pain when they uh, empty their bladder, what we call dysuria, or chronic pain even outside of menses. Um, other women will have issues with subfertility or infertility. Uh, that can happen in about 25% of cases. Um, and in 20% of cases, <clears throat> some women will present with or without symptoms, but are found to have like a cyst within an ovary, like an endometrioma. Interestingly, there are actually quite a few women who will have no symptoms and it's only found just incidentally as they're doing a workup for something else or um, if they're doing other testing. Um, so this is why this disease can be a little bit tricky because not every woman is gonna have the same experience or have the same symptoms or presentation and also will not necessarily respond in the same way. 
um, in terms of what treatment options are out there. Um, when we look at symptoms of pain, um, this is pro primarily around the time of the period. So pain during menstruation, um, what we call dysmenorrhea, that's the most common. Um, otherwise, because the scarring and the disease tissue is close to the back end of the cervix, oftentimes women will also have pain with intercourse. Um, it is common to have pain outside of the periods as well, low back pain, pain with having bowel movements or emptying the bladder, or general pain in the abdomen, as well as associated bloating. Um, when we look at why pain occurs, um, the mechanism that uh, we believe is happening is that there's just general inflammation that occurs with these um, glands, ectopic glands that kind of grow outside of the uterus. Um, and when your cycles are fluctuating, like when you're going through your periods, you have fluctuations of your hormones that will cause these um, glands to get engorged or grow and even bleed. Um, it's believed that when you have a cyst of the ovary, there's pressure because instead of having an ovary that's about two to three centimeters in size, you can grow cysts within the ovary that can be five centimeters or even larger up to 10 centimeters. So they can take up quite a bit of space, which can be really uncomfortable. And then the disease with the scarring from the inflammation that um, occurs near the lower part of the uterus and upper vagina is usually what can contribute to the pain with intercourse. And when we look at symptoms of pain, it's also believed that nerves can be involved. So when the tissue gets inflamed and engorged, when it, it responds to the fluctuations of the hormones, um, there are nerve fibers that are located as well that can be inflamed um, from that and that and then that can cause pain or pain even outside of um, menstruation, um, as well as change the sensitivity of your brain processing pain. So in, in some cases, the brain will actually analyze the pain as being abnormal and a much stronger singer, signal than it would be if you didn't have it. And then when we look at it, whether or not it involves other organs, you'd have symptoms kind of specific to those organs. If there was involvement of like the genitourinary tract, which involves like your bladder and your ureter, um, your kidneys, sometimes you'll urinate more frequently. Sometimes you'll have trouble holding urine. Otherwise there could be pain as you empty your bladder or spasms as well as blood within the urine. Um, for bowel lesions, you can have symptoms of constipation, diarrhea, bloating, as well as cramping. Um, it can also be painful when you try to have a bowel movement or you may notice blood in the stool if there is a lot of endometriosis involvement of the bowel itself. And then um, for patients who have um, endometriosis evolving the abdominal wall, they can have a painful mass that will grow when their periods come upon, or it could even bleed. So for some patients, we don't again fully understand why they can have involvement of like their belly button with endometriosis. So every month when they have a period, they'll actually have some bleeding that can happen from the belly button as well. Um, and this can happen for women who've never had surgery before, but um, it can be more common if you have endometriosis and you had surgery um, so that some of those glands may have transported as you have done the surgery to the skin and the fascia, which is the layer of tissue at the abdominal wall. And then very rarely, um, in some circumstances, you can have lung involvement of endometriosis. So again, correlating with their cycles, you can have, and you can end up having chest pain or difficulty breathing at the times of your period. Um, and then you may actually even also cough up blood if there's um, true lung involvement of endometriosis. Um, and then when we try to look at how um, endometriosis affects fertility, um, again, it's due to the chronic inflammation that occurs. Um, it produces harmful substances, causing scarring. Um, it stops the endometrium, the tubes, and the ovaries from working together well to become pregnant. It also distorts the anatomy so that in some cases, you know, you want the ovary to be very close to the tube so that the egg can transport into the tube and into the uterus in order to achieve a pregnancy. But sometimes the scarring with endometriosis, it moves the ovary well away from the tube or um, further away, or there's um, scar tissue around the tube that prevents the egg from being able to pass through. So in some cases it can block the tube. And if you look here um, on this picture, you can see this is just a picture of a uterus here. The fallopian tubes are here on the side, the ovaries are here, which is usually close by. But in some cases that ovary can be displaced away, making it harder for the egg to reach 
if you looked at this bottom picture, this is an example of actually really terrible endometriosis. It's really even hard to see. This is part of the uterus, so it does not look the same as that top picture. This is this left ovary, and you can't even see the fallopian tube. And here you can see that the intestines, like the large intestine is, is stuck to the ovary and the cyst that's here. So it's really hard how, you know, to have an egg be able to transfer from this to where I, we can't even see a tube in this picture itself. So that is um, one of the ways that um, endometriosis can affect fertility and make it harder to conceive naturally. So when we evaluate our patients, it's really important for us to get a really detailed discussion about the patient's history, their symptoms, um, you know, find out factors that could precipitate their symptoms because part of uh, our, our role is uh, kind of like to think of it as a detective is determining like what is causing the symptoms. And it's also important for us to understand that there can be more than one thing that is contributing symptoms. So for patients who have endometriosis, sometimes they can have other chronic pain, pain disorders that are also you know, contributing to their symptoms. So it is sometimes important to try to piece out things. So we oftentimes will ask questions about um, when the pain will occur, how often they're experiencing it, um, and at, you know, whether or not it's related to normal body functions, like going to the bathroom to urinate or going to the bathroom to have a bowel movement. Um, the physical exam is also very helpful in, in giving us information about whether or not there could be endometriosis. Oftentimes you can feel like a cyst of the ovary because it's enlarged um, when you're examining a patient. And that um, you can also feel scarring that can happen from the endometriosis when you're doing that exam and seeing whether or not um, your pelvic organs are moving around like normal as it would be if there was not endometriosis present. Um, in terms of laboratory testing, there's actually no specific lab tests for diagnosing endometriosis. There are certain blood work that can be elevated in the setting of endometriosis, but we really don't have any good blood tests that would help diagnose it itself. And otherwise, imaging is really important for us um, and can help us with the diagnosing it. Um, most commonly, we'll use pelvic ultrasounds as a first line way of evaluating the pelvic organs like the uterus and the ovaries. Um, and then MRI can give us a little bit of a deeper picture sometimes in certain cases. It may not specifically pick up small disease of endometriosis um, in some situations, but it can see larger disease like a cyst with an ovary, if there's like a nodule that can involve the bowel, or if there's endometriosis in the muscle layer of the uterus. So that can help be helpful for us as well. So as part of the evaluation, um, you know, it's important for us again to piece out to make sure whether or not endometriosis is present or if there are other kind of chronic pain disorders that could be going along at the same time. So we have to always rule out pelvic infections, um, look for whether or not there's any evidence of adenomyosis, which is a benign condition. Some people refer to it as endometriosis within the uterus. This is a condition where the glands of the lining of the uterus specifically grow in the muscle layer of the uterus. So for most women with adenomyosis, they can have issues with pain, especially during their periods, as well as heavy bleeding, because it's involving the uterus itself. Um, sometimes patients with fibroids can have issues with pain as well, and also cause those pressure type of symptoms on the other organs, like the bladder or the intestines. Um, whether or not there's cysts of the ovaries that are present, any sign of infections like of the bladder or something called painful bladder syndrome. Back in the day, it was also called interstitial cystitis, where you can have a disorder of the bladder itself that can cause symptoms of pain or frequency or urgency when you try to go to the bathroom. Um, other chronic pain disorders like fibromyalgia, neuropathic pain, irritable bowel syndrome, functional bowel disorders, pelvic floor dysfunction, um, the list kind of can go on and on. But um, a lot of times we have to, you know, piece out again, whether or not it is simply endometriosis or if you have more than one thing going on at the same time. So getting that thorough history, doing the examination and getting all that imaging um, is really crucial for us. Um, when we diagnose endometriosis, um, the gold standard is getting a piece of the tissue and actually testing it with the pathologist to confirm that there's actually these endometriosis glands within that specimen. So back in the day, um, we used to just simply look at something and say, oh, this looks like endometriosis. And um, studies have shown that we were about 
we would write only about 50% of the time. So similar to flipping a coin. So we're really not good at that. So more importantly, it's important to get actually a specimen and having that evaluated to see if endometriosis is present. So you can see here, um, this is, these are pictures from one of my partners where there's a range of how they can present. So you can have these kind of powder burn lesions that are here. You can have clear lesions. You can have the scarring that can happen with the endometriosis. Um, and so the lesions can look very different. So anything that looks suspicious should usually be biopsied, at least to confirm whether or not endometriosis is present. And in some rare cases, sometimes you may actually not see anything um, during the time of the surgery, which we typically do laparoscopically. So with a high definition type of um, camera to be able to see everything in a magnified way. Um, and in some cases it can be helpful to do even um, biopsies of what appears to be normal tissue around where the most common sites are. And you can often, you can sometimes find microscopic disease of endometriosis too. Um, there is a classification system that we have that helps us to kind of grade the extent of endometriosis that patients can have. Um, this was developed by the American Society of Reproductive Medicine, and it basically provides um, like a standard way of approaching how we describe the findings that you have. So you can have stage one disease where you have just minimal little spots of endometriosis, stage two where you have um, more or larger lesions, um, stage three where it starts to involve the ovary and um, the back end of the uterus, the ligaments, that lead or sacral ligament that I had talked about before. And then stage four is where you can have deep, deeper disease or larger extensive disease with involvement of the other organs like the bladder and the intestines. Um, this can be helpful um, when we're trying to manage patients uh, who have subfertility or infertility symptoms. Um, and then it is important to know that, interestingly, the extent of the disease you have doesn't always correlate with how pain, how much pain a patient can experience. So some patients can have like stage one disease, which in your mind think, oh, it's very tiny, shouldn't cause any problems, but they can have severe debilitating pain. Whereas some patients may have stage four disease where everything is like stuck together, what we often call like a frozen pelvis. Um, and surprisingly, they have little or no symptoms. And that's just incidentally found if they were doing surgery for another type of gynecologic disorder. So again, this is part of the tricky part of endometriosis in that the, you know, we don't fully understand how it develops. We don't fully understand why patients some have, have some symptoms versus other, or why you can have extensive disease or very minimal disease, and it doesn't always correlate with the symptoms. So it makes it a little bit harder. So in terms of diagnosis, sometimes you can use just clinical um, history to kind of diagnose it, and you can presume that there's endometriosis. Um, this can be based on a combination of the symptoms, the signs, um, examination findings. Um, you know, sometimes it's 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 easier to start a medication, which is less invasive. So back in the day, I think in most cases um, we ended up. Uh, treating people for presumed endometriosis by using hormone therapy as a first line, um, and then go, moving towards surgery in cases where patients didn't re necessarily respond. And I do think that's partly why we delayed diagnosis for this patients so that they would try a lot of different type of medical managements, see if that worked for them. And then eventually, if they did not respond, then doing a laparoscopy to diagnose it. So um, that is why in some cases, patients can wait up to seven years before being diagnosed from like the start of their symptoms to now. Um, I do think nowadays we have moved more towards um, performing diagnostic surgery to help evaluate for endometriosis. And partly I think that's helpful for patients so that they know what might be going on if there specifically is endometriosis. And then it kind of allows you to have like a, a little bit more of a game plan of like how you're gonna address it and try to improve the uh, patient's quality of life. Um, when we look at the treatment for it, first line of therapy is usually um, pain medication just to help treat the inflammation and the pain that's associated with endometriosis. So that's your NSAIDs, like your ibuprofen, your Aleve. Um, beyond that, because we know it does correlate with hormone fluctuations and estrogen, um, using hormone suppression so that you can avoid having those different spikes of your hormones can help um, make the endometriosis glands more suppressed. So that's your combination birth control, whether it's pills, a patch, a ring. 
You can also choose to use progesterone only types of options like a pill, an injection, or even an IUD that has progesterone in it. Um, there are also medications, um, what we call gonadotropin releasing hormone agonists and antagonists, which are medications that basically try to suppress your ovaries. So that's not producing the estrogen that can feed the endometriosis. And then two other medications like danazole and aromatase inhibitors are also medications that help to decrease your body's production of estrogen. So there's no data to support that one method or one um, medical option is better than the other. Um, it's really about the patient's history, what medications they can take or what they've tried before in the past, um, if there's any contraindications for certain types of medications, what the patient's preferences are, what their goals are, if there's any um, thoughts of um, pursuing um, conception in that that moment or whether or not they are finished with having children. So, you know, these types of treatment options are really catered towards the patient, that individual, depending on what their needs are and what their goals are for the future. Um, and otherwise, um, again, the goals are to try to manage the symptoms so that it can improve the patient's quality of life so that they can have normal daily function. So, um, in general though, the, the advantages of having medical management is that it's low risk, right? In comparison to surgery, it's usually pretty well tolerated. It can be as effective as some surgical therapy where patients can have improvement of their pain significantly. Um, and you would avoid the potential risk that can be associated with surgery. Um, some considerations to make is that unfortunately with medical management, um, in a lot of ways, you're really just treating the disease or you're trying to suppress it so it doesn't grow further. So it doesn't necessarily take it away. So there's a high rate of recurrence of your symptoms. Um, and that um, most of our options that we have currently today, actually currently all of them, um, are medications that would prevent you from being able to get pregnant in that moment. So that can be a little bit of a tricky situation for these reproductive age patients. So when do we consider surgery? Um, if the patient is wanting to have a pregnancy in the near future, if their pain has not responded to the traditional medications that we've offered, um, it can be helpful in some cases to establish a diagnosis, getting that tissue sample and confirming whether or not endometriosis is present. Um, if there is a cyst of an ovary, unfortunately, none of the medications that we have will really make that cyst go away. You actually would need to have surgery to remove that cyst. And in some cases that can help with improving fertility rates. Um, medications that we have can maybe prevent the cyst from growing larger, but it's definitely not gonna make it disappear. And then otherwise, um, if there is infertility related to endometriosis, then that's when we tend to operate. So there's different modes of thought on um, what you do in surgically treating endometriosis. Um, some people are true believers about excising or removing the lesions. Um, and other people um, like to ablate them. So basically get burn or vaporize the lesions. So this is usually done through laparoscopy. Um, when you compare the results between those two types of methods, there's really was no um, significant difference in terms of pain scores. Um, it really was kind of a physician um, or surgeon preference. And it could also depend on where it's located. Like if you had a lesion really close to like the ureter, which is a vital structure for your kidneys um, or the intestines, then there may be a, a tendency, a less of a tendency to cut it out because there is a higher risk of potentially cutting into those organs. And in those cases, you may um, choose, the surgeon may choose to just burn those lesions. Um, but again, those are two kind of schools of thought. And um, so surgeons will differ on that. Um, I personally like to excise the lesions because that, again, at the very least, I would be able to get a diagnosis to confirm whether or not endometriosis is present. Um, in moving towards um, more definitive surgery for endometriosis, because it's all related to hormones, again, it's a little bit of a tricky situation. In most cases for these reproductive age women, you are producing the normal estrogen and progesterone from your ovaries. Um, and that's gonna continue until you go through menopause. So once you hit menopause, um, in most situations, symptoms associated with endometriosis will either decrease or go away. Um, in, and so in some cases, when a woman is finished with having children and they have persistent pain and they don't respond to medical therapy or more conservative surgery, then that's when um, a hysterectomy or a surgery where you remove the uterus would be indicated. 
So those, this is usually offered to patients who have persistent symptoms, who have significant reduction in their quality of life, who haven't responded to other medical or surgical therapy, who are not interested in carrying a pregnancy, um, and when you've kind of optimized all other potential um, causes for pain. Um, it can provide a longer period of symptom relief and a, a lower long-term need for additional surgery or even continued medical management. Um, but you know, you have to consider the fact that once you remove the uterus, um, you're not going to be able to carry a pre pregnancy, and that surgery itself does have um, risk that can um, result in some complications, although that is pretty rare. Um, some people will consider oophorectomy, which is the fancy word of saying taking out the ovaries. Um, a definitive way to manage endometriosis because then you're removing kind of the source of est estrogen, the major source of estrogen for your body. Um, so it's more, it can be more effective in terms of managing symptoms and have a lower risk of recurrence. Um, this can be beneficial for women who have um, extensive ovarian disease involving endometriosis. Um, the downside of that is that you would go through menopause earlier because once the ovaries are removed, you're, you're not being able to produce that on your own. There can be long-term health effects that are associated with that. And you may need to consider hormone replacement therapy for some symptoms that you have after. Um, when we look at the um, surgical treatment options for endometriosis, when you excise it or you burn the lesions, the recurrent, um, the incidence of recurrent pain is about 20 to 40%. Um, the need for an additional surgery is about 20% within two years. Um, and then if you were to have a hysterectomy done where you're removing the uterus to address endometriosis, the reoperation rate is like 20% at seven years. Um, if you were to do the definitive surgery where you take out the uterus along with the ovaries, then the reoperation rate is much lower at five to 10% at seven years. So in a lot of cases, we see patients who have undergone multiple surgeries before, you know, initial diagnosis, then surgical management. Each surgery that you do does carry a greater risk because each time you do a surgery, there can be scar tissue that forms, which will then affect the normal anatomy and make things a little bit difficult, more difficult. Um, it is important to just try to focus on the treatment of pain and symptoms, not just the lesions. Um, oftentimes it is beneficial to be on some type of hormone replacement after you've had like a surgical procedure where you've removed as much endometriosis as possible, just to help to slow the recurrence down uh, for at least six months after the surgery. And then it is important to have that discussion with our patients that it is a chronic dis condition and that it's something that a patient may have to ma manage or deal with up until menopause. So a long-term plan um, is important to have. Um, when we look specifically at endometriosis, endometriomas, um, you know, these are cysts of ovaries that have endometriosis in it. Um, we typically do remove these surgically because there is no medication that would, you know, quote unquote, take it away. Um, we remove them when patients have pain or when they have symptoms because as the cyst gets larger, it can then impact the other organs that are close by, like the bladder or the intestines. Um, there are possible risks when you have a big cyst like that, because if you think of like a water balloon, it's really heavy, where it could twist on its own blood supply, what we call ovarian torsion, in which case that would become like an emergent type of surgery, because otherwise you could lose the whole ovary rather than just, you know, removing the cyst and saving the ovary. Um, not as common with endometriosis, only because usually that scarring and inflammation with endometriosis will cause that cyst to be just be stuck somewhere, whether it's like to the side of the body or behind the uterus. Um, otherwise, these cysts potentially could rupture. Again, not very common spontaneously on its own, but if it were to rupture and leak fluid, that can cause a lot of pain for patients. Um, and then for cases for patients who have subfertility or infertility, um, removal of these cysts can actually help improve fertility rates. Because if you can imagine that ovary has been expanded, right, because of the cyst, so the eggs that you have, which are on that surface white part of the ovary here in this picture, may not be able to as effectively ovulate during those times. Um, in terms of looking at treatment with endometriomas, it is important to understand that, unfortunately, these types of cysts can come back. So even when we remove the cyst away from the ovary, preserve the ovary, there is a 25% chance that you can have another endometrioma within that same ovary within two years after surgery. 
Removal of the cysts definitely has lower recurrence rates versus like if you just burned the inner lining of the cyst. Um, and that, you know, being on medical suppressive therapy won't necessarily reduce the absolute risk of recurrence, but can slow it down for patients. The other important thing to understand is that, you know, surgery on the ovary can affect the ovarian function. So you have to kind of cut into the ovary to remove the cyst. Um, and that can potentially compromise some of the normal ovarian tissue, which means you could take away some normal healthy eggs. Um, and that as you do multiple surgeries on the same ovary, then that is an accumulative effect on the ovary itself and can reduce the number of eggs that you have on that side. There's no good clear guideline for in terms of timing of surgery. Um, for smaller cysts of the ovary, we usually try to manage them medically um, or some patients will still undergo fertility treatments um, with these cysts in place because you kind of have to balance the risk and benefits of like surgery and um, you know the desire for future fertility. So it's important for us to kind of coordinate that with like the patient's goals for family planning um, and also in conjunction with consulting our fertility experts on recommendations that they have. So in some cases, if there is a small endometrioma or cyst of the ovary with endometriosis and the patient is not symptomatic, then and they can proceed with fertility treatments, um, but in some cases, if um, conception is not achieved, then that's where removal of the cyst can be helpful. Um, so just because a patient has endometriosis doesn't necessarily mean that they are gonna be infertile. Um, there is just higher risks of issues with fertility if you do have endometriosis present. So there's so many factors that play into um, conceiving. You can have female as well as male factors. So it is important to fully get evaluated by a fertility doctor to see what, what may be playing a role in terms of um, the inability to get pregnant on your own. Um, so some take home points to end with, um, this is a disorder that's characterized by endometrial tissue that grows outside of the uterus. Um, it is hormone dependent, so it does respond to estrogen, uh, which allows it to grow, cause inflammation, resulting in scarring as well as pain. Um, it most commonly will affect premenopausal women, so women in their reproductive years. Um, in most cases, it, the symptoms will either get much less or go away by menopause. So when you're not producing that estrogen or progesterone for your ovaries, um, the definitive cause is unknown, but it looks like it could be multi-factor for multifactorial um, in, in nature. Um, the most common theory is that um, there's the retrograde menstruation where the blood will pass backwards um, through the fallopian tubes and then implant in the pelvis and on the ovaries. Um, in terms of common presentation, you could have no symptoms. You could have issues with a mass that's found on examination or on imaging. You can have issues with pain or fertility. So it can be a wide range of how patients will present and have symptoms. The only definitive way to diagnose it is through surgery. So um, taking a look with the camera and then biopsying the tissue and confirming that pathology. Um, management options do range, and this again is a big discussion between the provider and the patient about what the goals are, what the preferences are, what fertility plans there are. So you have medical and surgical treatment options um, that are available. In some cases, it can require long-term medical therapy even after surgery. Um, and oftentimes we do manage patients with endometriosis along with fertility specialists because of that connection of issues with fertility in some patients who have endometriosis. And again, just being really aware um, of a patient's preference, what their treatment goals are, what their fertility plans is, is essential when we kind of, um, when we kind of manage this condition. And then are there any questions? Well, thank you, Dr. Wang. Lots of information there. And um, just to really start it off before we get to the viewers' questions. So how often are women misdiagnosed? Because so the symptoms, you know, you met, I'm sorry, to, uh, there are so many classic symptoms that you were talking about, you know, bloating and pain. And of course, when women have periods, how they feel, you know, premenstrual uh, symptoms and things like that. So um, how often do you think? So 
I mean, I think it, it is quite often, unfortunately. Um, they have done studies to look that it could be up to seven years from when the patient starts to have symptoms before they're truly diagnosed with it. Mm -hmm. Part of the issue is that a lot of the symptoms are so vague, right? Bloating, right, right. pain with your periods, um, pain when you have a bowel movement, pain with intercourse. Like it can be so variable for people. Um, and I think for a lot of women, we tend to kind of, I guess, normalize like what is normal for us, right? So I've always had pain from the very start of the time when I first had my first period. So that's right. my normal, right? So right. Right. It's, it's really hard, I think, for patients to really understand that there could be something going on with the symptoms that I have, or like, I bleed so heavily that I'm anemic, but that's my normal, right? So those kind of scenarios where it makes it harder. And because a lot of the symptoms are so vague, it can be related to other types of disorders, right? Mm -hmm. Bowel disorders or bladder disorders. So sometimes it can be a little bit hard to piece out. Um, so I think, uh, you know, it's important for patients to try to, to try advocate to. for their health um, and, you know, make mention of these symptoms to their providers so that they can try to focus on what they're ha experiencing and then going down that road of like helping to diagnose and then manage those symptoms. Sure. So that makes sure your, your annual visit to your GYN, even that much more important because at least they can be, you can be following them and you can be seeing the changes, correct? Like, you know, over the, the months and the years to see, wait a minute, this is, this is not normal. Right. Exactly. Right. And then, you know, sometimes on those exams, you may find something right that the patient mm -hmm. didn't even realize that they were having because it's like a slow growth of like a cyst of an ovary. Sure. But then your gynecologist feels it on exam and is like, huh, this is something that's different from the last time I saw you. Let's mm -hmm. get some imaging to get some confirmation. And then maybe at that point, exploring like, 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 are you feeling anything? Do you notice anything? And then yes. sometimes patients will then be like, well, as a matter of fact, I seem to go to the bathroom more often. I'm having more right. issues with bloating, right? And so right. Um, it's and tough things they're not thinking of. Yeah, no, normally they're just not things they're, they're thinking of. They're like, oh, this is normal. Exactly, yeah. So well, great, very, thank you for, yeah. for that clarification. So we're gonna get started with um, a question from um, Jermaine. And she'd like to know, um, she has two questions. Uh, how is it, is it known how endometriosis happens? And also if you have a similar condition with ovarian cells, how far from the uterus have endometrial cells been found? Okay. So to answer the first question, um, you know, there's four theories about how endometriosis can develop. The most common theory is um, what we call Samson's theory, which is like about men retrograde menstruation, where instead of having the blood flow out through the, from the uterus, through the cervix and out of the body, it can flow back through the fallopian tubes and then it can implant within the pelvis in that way. Mm -hmm. And then um, other theories include that the fact that these cells can just change from like normal, what we call salomic cells into endometriosis, or it can pass through the lymphatic system and then implant elsewhere, or it can pass through blood vessels and implant elsewhere as well. Um, in terms of the farthest place, I mean, I think the lungs would probably be the farthest place um, for endometriosis in terms of away from the pelvic region. So those are very rare cases um, and they can sometimes be more difficult to treat, right? Because lung involvement, it's a major organ that you need. Um, and, and so um, that would probably be the farthest place where it's been found. Um, most commonly, again, in the pelvis area, but it can be found in your intestine, in your bladder. It can be found in the abdominal wall, like even your belly button, and then as far away as the lungs. Great, thank you very much. Our next question, uh, Dr. Wang, is from Jamie, and she would like to know, is there an age that's too young for surgical diagnosis? Not necessarily. So, you know, um, the reason partly why they think um, retrograde menstruation is not the only way that endometriosis develops is that there are girls who haven't gone through pu puberty yet, right? They haven't started their periods, and they've been found to also have endometriosis. So, how would that happen if they haven't started having a period? And that's where the whole like potential lymphatics or the blood vessel transfer or like the cells changing comes into play. So for young girls, um, you know, if they have symptoms of pain or bloating or bowel symptoms, it sometimes can be useful to um, go down that road of exploring whether or not endometriosis could be present. 
Sometimes the diagnosis can be a little bit trickier, right? We don't tend to do ultrasounds in the vagina for women or for girls who haven't become active yet. It can be uncomfortable. Um, but we always have imaging that we can do and then um, evaluation to see whether or not what could be causing the symptoms that they're having, like could be it bowel related, could it be GYN related, could, could it be, you know, um, bladder related. So um, if you do have the symptoms, I do think it's worth discussing that, you know, with the pediatrician and then um, getting more information so that you can see. And in some cases, some women just have painful periods but not endometriosis. And some of that is still managed with hormone suppression because you know that's what our gynecologic organs respond to, hormones. Um, so it, it wouldn't necessarily hurt to improve um, someone's quality of life by starting a birth control pill if they needed it, if they have symptoms. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Uh, our next question is from Lisa and she'd like to know, is there any documented evidence of racial or ethnic disparity in those affected by endometriosis? Yeah. So in, in with endometriosis is actually more commonly found in white women and in Asian women in comparison to African American and Hispanic women. Great. Thank you. Um, this question is from Sarah and she'd like to know. So you mentioned about hormonal imbalances. Um, and so if you're diagnosed with a hormonal imbalance, should you, should you then tell your gynecologist and then what about other autoimmune issues such as like thyroid issues? Yeah, so those are two separate um, potential issues. I mean, with a hormone imbalance, you know, we don't have any good tests to diagnose that definitively. We have a blood test that can show you kind of if you're menopausal or not, right? So it's really hard to know whether or not someone is truly hormonally imbalanced, like if they're predominant with estrogen or progesterone. Sometimes in a patient's history or in their symptoms, you may think that there are issues where you're more estrogen dominant. And again, that's where being on a birth control to kind of keep even things out would be usually advised. Um, and then in terms of immune disorders, you know, there is a potential immune, immuno, immune um, correlation with endometriosis where if a patient is immunocompressed, immunocompromised, excuse me, um, and their immune system is not able to kind of clear, right, these endometrial cells that may implant every single month when you're having a period, then um, that may be more common for them. Um, but we don't have any true information yet about like whether or not if you correct immune disorder, whether or not endometriosis would improve. Um, partly because again, it's so complex and there's that hormone relation to it. Thyroid mm -hmm. hormone is a little bit different where thyroid hormones can affect your, your menstrual cycle. But um, I'm, I don't think there's a correlation of thyroid disease and endometriosis that we're aware of yet. Mm -hmm. So I guess then, so if you happen to have an autoimmune disease then, and you have, you have these symptoms of, of endometriosis, but you haven't been diagnosed yet, mm -hmm. but you, but you do have an autoimmune uh, disease, um, are you more susceptible then to endometriosis? I don't think we have the information to know that for sure. Um, you know, but you know, part of the theory of why endometriosis can happen in some patient populations versus others is that potential immune factor. Um, but we we don't have anything definitive to say that that would be a correlation. So, okay, great. Not yet. But if they do have the symptoms, again, going through the workup for endometriosis sure. would be recommended. Yeah. Sure. Why not? Yeah. Uh, next question, uh, Dr. Wang, is from Bridget. Can retrograde mens menstruation occur in women who do not have endometriosis? Yes, so that it, that can happen. And so again, not every woman develops endometriosis, even if they do experience retrograde menstruation. Mm -hmm. So again, this kind of just speaks to the fact of how complex endometriosis is, where some patients can get these symptoms, some patients may not have it, or even if they're at like a higher risk because of those situations. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why it makes it a little bit tricky because also patients don't respond necessarily in the same way for with treatment, right? Some patients who have surgery do really well, have no more symptoms ever again, which again is unusual because you think about how the disease is and how 
typically you can have those symptoms up until menopause, whereas other patients may have to have surgery after surgery and continue to have symptoms or and that are not managed with the, that surgery. So that's why, again, it's just such a tricky disease to, to manage and that that's why it's important to have that kind of individualized um, treatment plan for that mm -hmm. patient because everyone's going to respond differently and everyone's going to have different symptoms. So, um, yeah. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Our next question is from Marianne, and she would like to know, how has treatment and surgeries changed in the last 30 to 35 years? Uh, I'm a little bit sad to say that it hasn't changed <laughs> a ton. I mean, I think we are better at recognizing these symptoms nowadays and moving towards doing like a diagnostic surgery or a surgery intervention earlier than we used to do. Um, but in terms of medical therapy options, it's kind of similar to what we've had before, where it's like hormone suppression, whether it's like a combination birth control pill or a progesterone only. There is one newer medication that has come out, but it's pretty similar in terms of the mechanism of um, Lupron, which is a medicine where it kind of suppresses your ovaries so you're not producing that estrogen and progesterone. Mm -hmm. um, and it is a little bit better tolerated in terms of fewer side effects, like the hot flashes, mood swings, vaginal dryness, and bone loss if you take it for a long period of time. So we do have a newer medication, but it honestly, mechanism-wise works in the same way as medications that we've had in the past. Um, and then surgery wise, I don't think we necessarily have any new techniques for it. We have new instruments that can be helpful for these types of surgeries, like doing the surgeries nowadays, we're doing them minimally invasive, which is really great for the patient because there's less risk of bleeding, less risk of infection, a much faster recovery. Patients can go home the same day of the surgery. Um, probably 30, 30 years ago in the past, everyone did these surgeries through like a big incision, like an open laparotomy. So either a large up and down incision or a cross one where you have to stay in the hospital for a long period of time, there's higher risks, like the bleeding, the infection, hernias that can develop. And then um, it's a much longer recovery. So I think we have moved more towards a slightly different technique of doing the same surgery um, that has improved in terms of patient outcomes. So patients do much better nowadays with, with this type of approach. Thank you. Nice to hear we've made some improvements in that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> You know, well, women, you know, women are, it, 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 women in science are a, a little bit longer, but it's getting much better. Exactly. Yes. Okay. So um, the next question is from Ella and, and um, there's actually quite a few questions on, on this. So her question is, does endometriosis disappear after menopause? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's an interesting question. So in theory, in, and in most cases, I would say that women who have symptomatic pain from endometriosis, once mm -hmm. they do go through menopause, the symptoms are either much less or they do go away. Um, you know, it's interesting in some cases for women who have endometriosis during a pregnancy, your progesterone levels are actually higher and your estrogen levels are lower just based on pregnancy and what's produced by the placenta. So for a lot of these women, even though they had bad endometriosis before, once they are able to get pregnant during a pregnancy, actually some symptoms abate. And so they really don't have symptoms of pain. And in some cases, they don't have pain even after they deliver, but in other situations, sometimes it does recur. So um, it's just a very interesting kind of disease that again, doesn't always behave in the way that we would expect it to. Um, I would say a majority of women, once they do go through menopause, will find that their symptoms do go away, but there is still a small population that may have continued symptoms even, even through menopause. Right. So they, but does it, does it actually disappear? Can it uh, disappear completely once you have endometriosis can just disappear on its own without any treatment or surgeries, et cetera? If it's small disease, it definitely can. Cause some, sometimes we'll operate on a patient and they have terrible disease everywhere. You do like, a, you know, a full clean out kind of thing over time, kind of symptoms recur, and then you'll go back in to operate and you may actually not see any active disease. You may only see like kind of old disease. Um, so it is definitely possible for that to happen. Again, it's a mysterious disease. Right, so, and also then taking next part of the question too, is if you're taking hormonal replacement therapy, Mm -hmm. Um, and of course that's going to include some, can include some estrogen or will include some estrogen actually. Yeah. Um, so obviously if you had endometriosis going into it, that might make it worse. 
Potentially. Yeah. But yes. the amount of hormones that are in a hormone replacement um, versus like the amount of endogenous hormones that your body produces is going to be very different. Mm -hmm. So um, theoretically that definitely can happen. Um, but it doesn't always necessarily. So there are some patients who are menopausal with a history of bad endometriosis who are on hormone replacement, but then don't have any type of like flare of their symptoms while they're on it. So, mm -hmm. um, but some, some will, so it, it, again, because of the tricky nature of the disease, it's like hard to know, but for each patient, that's going to be a little bit different. Right. So, so there might, there, at least for women who have endometriosis now, Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that's maybe might be one positive thing about menopause that right. their symptoms may get better. Yes. 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 That's true. So there, there's a point in that column for that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right. We'll take it, you know, we'll take it. Um, so what, uh, re what research is, is currently going on at, at Johns Hopkins or at least new treatment options, um, that you maybe know of or can discuss? Yeah. So, I mean, there are ongoing trials and looking at medications, like different medications to see whether or not that can help with managing symptoms of endometriosis. Um, that's ongoing here at Hopkins. Um, that's led by our director of research, Dr. James Seegers. Mm -hmm. um, so if anyone is interested, if you Google him on his, um, his webpage for, uh, from Hopkins, he'll, he'll have like a list of his ongoing studies to see if, if a patient kind of qualifies for that and would be interested in participating. Um, you know, we're always trying to look at, you know, outcomes in terms of like how patients do with surgeries. Um, and whether or not there has been improvement of their symptoms, but otherwise, you know, we're, we're currently limited in terms of what new technologies or what new medications outside of what kind of currently exists, right? Like the hormonal approach to it, mm -hmm. um, in terms of what's going on so far, it's, you know, it's hard. I think there is definitely a lot of funding out there. Um, and there is a lot of interest in looking to see, like for us to get more information because it is such to some degree, a black box of, you know, we don't fully truly understand it. And that's why we have so much difficulty with managing it for every patient. Sure. Yep. Great. Thank you. I'm, I'm sure though, that, that we, we will come through with some more breakthroughs yes. and we'll have to have you on again to talk about that. Love it. Um, yeah. We have a, a, another question here. Well, it looks like we have a few more minutes here. So uh, Bridget um, says, uh, you mentioned that lesions could grow into the bowel. So how is this addressed? Yeah. So one, we have to first look at the suspicion for it because you do want to have a good workup beforehand, because if it does involve the bowel, then we need to coordinate that surgery with surgeons who manage like the intestines, right? Because that's a different type of surgery from like the gynecologic organs that we address. Um, so oftentimes we'll do testing like an MRI to see if there is extension of the disease into the bowel. If there are symptoms of like bleeding every time you have a period, then there, that would be a worry that there is uh, enough of involvement of the bowel that it's affecting like the inside of the intestine. So in, in those cases, we oftentimes will recruit, you know, one of our col colorectal surgeon colleagues and ask them to assess the patient and do a colonoscopy or a proctoscopy to look inside to see if they're able to see those lesions. And then combining that information with the MRI then allows you to have a surgical plan where if the patient is symptomatic, then, you know, the goal is to remove that portion of the bowel where there is endometriosis involvement um, and then reconnecting the bowel so that the patient can have normal bowel function. And that will depend on like where the lesion is um, in terms of whether or not that's possible or in some rare cases, sometimes you may have to have either a temporary or permanent colostomy if the lesion involves a, a much lower part of the large intestine. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. It looks like we just have maybe just under a minute real, real fast. So I hate to put you under the gun, but no, fine. last question, if you can briefly um, uh, talk about the connection between endometriosis and bleeding. Is that, is that a definite, like if you have, if, for all patients who have endometriosis, do they have bloating? Oh, um, in most situations they will, because for some reason with those glands, with the hormonal changes, they get engorged. And so they grow mm -hmm. and right next to the uterus, right next to the ovary is your intestine. So oftentimes that'll kind of irritate the bowel and the bowel can cause like, you know, uh, they can dilate, which can cause that bloating sensation. Right. Um, so right. it definitely is common to have that symptom alongside of it. 
Great. Well, thank you so much. It looks like we're at the eight o'clock hour and I'm sorry to have to, to end this conversation, but thank you, Dr. Wang, for joining us this evening and to everyone out there, thank you so much for joining us. And graciously, Dr. Wang has agreed to respond to the questions that were not addressed this evening. And you'll receive an email with her answers in about two weeks. Oh, the video of tonight's live stream will be available on the A Women's Journey website, hopkinsmedicine.org slash A Women's Journey under videos on demand. If you've enjoyed tonight's discussion, please check out our website, hopkinsmedicine.org slash A Women's Journey for information about future conversations and podcasts, all featuring Johns Hopkins physicians and faculty and brought to you by A Woman's Journey. In the meantime, we hope you'll find our monthly email informative and engaging. Good night and stay well. Thank you for having me.